welcome to Presenza, Giulia Ciccoli. Thank you for well, having me. Thank you for being here. Welcome to this space of women who build the future. Welcome home. Thank you. Giulia, Giulia Ciccoli is one of the founder of Still I Rise. That is an independent international organization that is very active in the field of refugees rights and especially refugees children rights. And they have built and uh, are building schools in different countries, in Greece, in Syria, in Kenya, in Turkey, to give these children not only an education, but also a protection and a dignity. And these schools have faced difficulties in recently because of all the limitation imposed by COVID. And in some cases, they have been closed. And this is why uh, Julia is now in Samos, in the Greek island of Samos, where she had been living for more than three years. When I invited her to do this interview, I thought she was in Turkey because she went there this summer to help opening a school there. But then this school was closed. And so she came back to Samos. And so she's talking with us from this small Greek island where thousands of refugees are living in terrible condition. And so first I would like to ask Julia to describe a bit the situation. Uh, what is happening to these people fleeing from war, from poverty, arriving there, and uh, they are forced to live in this terrible inhuman condition. So to talk a bit about this, and also about the inhuman policies that the European Union is applying to them, because this is not a natural situation. This is uh, the result of terrible choices. Yes, definitely. Um, so yeah, Samos is um, quite a small Greek island um, together with four other islands that are Lesbos, Hios, Kos, and Leros, um, they're Greek islands very close to Turkey. So these are basically border islands. Uh, it's the first point of entry uh, from, uh, for asylum seekers uh, crossing over from Turkey into Europe, basically. Um, these islands um, were, you know, again, quiet remote islands until uh, 2014, 2015, uh, which at the time was the height of the refugee, the Syrian crisis in, uh, in Europe, where many Syrians started crossing over looking, looking for protection in Europe. So um, since then, actually soon, next week, will be five years of the EU-Turkey deal. So that time uh, there was a high influx of, of uh, refugees. I don't know if you remember uh, Germany opening their doors and uh, welcoming more than 1 million Syrians back then. Um, but then Europe's solution was uh, basically to close the borders. Uh, this was a decision made by many European states. Um, so in 2016, the European Union made a deal with Turkey uh, which basically meant money uh, to Turkey, uh, 3 billion euros first and then 3 billion euros later to keep um, refugees there. So for their coast guard to actually patrol the sea and uh, whenever they would find boats in Turkish waters, take them back. Uh, in return, uh, European states were supposed to uh, relocate legally uh, Syrian asylum seekers from um, Turkey directly to EU countries, that hasn't really happened. Um, and that's when the European concept of hotspots was created. So these islands basically became, for those who made it uh, from Turkey into Greece, um, closed, were supposed to be closed camps 
uh, where people were supposed to go through a fast procedure to apply for asylum in Greece. Uh, and then those who wouldn't qualify be deported and those who would qualify, they could start their life uh, in Greece. In practice, that hasn't really worked uh, because uh, people started coming and um, hotspots like the one on Samos was built for 648 people. And at its highest, it hosted uh, 8,000 people in, in 2018. Uh, in absolutely inhumane and degrading conditions um, because obviously there was simply no more space and the asylum procedure is still going very slowly. People end up spending years stuck on these islands just waiting for an answer to their asylum application. And obviously if a place is meant for 600 people and you have 10 times that number of people, it means that the camp basically overspilled and the same happened on all the other uh, four islands. So people have lived for years now, mostly in the so-called jungle. So this forest area outside the camp, uh, they are not provided with anything. So they have to build their own shelter or buy a tent. Um, there is no electricity uh, in the jungle. Um, only thanks to NGOs, water is provided, very limited toilets. Um, the, there, is, there still is a high number of children and women. We have pregnant women who spend their whole pregnancy in the camp. Um, some of them deliver their baby in the camp. Sometimes if they're lucky enough that they make it to the hospital for delivery, then after two days, they're sent back to camp with a newborn baby in a tent. And this has been going on for years. Um, and we really don't see, very sadly, an end in sight. Um, last September, the, the camp on Lesbos called Moria, which was the biggest refugee camp in Europe, at the time there were about 13,000 people living there, uh, completely went up in flames. And that's when we thought that European leaders would understand that their policy of containing these people on these tiny islands with very slow asylum procedures in horrifying living conditions was literally blowing up in their faces. We thought they would understand the need for change. And the new pact on asylumism and migration was meant to be um, discussed the, and proposed that the next week. And when that happened, we realized that it's the same policies, the same policy, policies of confinement and deterrence, um, which will lead to no change. <laughs> and it, people will continue living in horrifying conditions. And these are people that for many different reasons had to leave home because nobody nobody would live in such horrifying, undignified conditions unless it was their only choice. Nobody would raise their children there. Um, what I often say, you know, I wish EU leaders not, and Greek leaders would not just come for a brief visit. Would, would they stay one day in that camp? Would they bring their children one day in that camp? The answer is no, nobody would. So why should other people live there? So the situation is very, very critical. It has been critical for years now, and we see absolutely no intention of change, uh, of moving towards a more humane policy, neither from the Greek government nor from European leaders. And that is why we are here. Um, we shouldn't be here. We are an NGO. It's should be a government's responsibility to act on this, they aren't. So we're doing our best to fill in gaps. And uh, one of them is education because these children are not allowed in school. So we stepped in and we built a center for them. Um, we teach teenage children from 11 to 17 years old. And we do everything we can to provide a safe space for them, to give them an education, to protect them and to fight for their rights. Yeah, thank you, Julia. It's 
very important everything you are saying. Thank you. And what motivated you to do this choice and what is giving you the force to go on doing all the things you are doing despite all the this injustice, the difficulties you face every day? So I wish I could tell you that you know, I knew immediately this was going to be my life and I left the privileged life I had before and, and I moved here, but that didn't happen. It was a slow process. I, I had a life in Italy, that's where I'm from, and I had a job and everything and I came uh, to Samos first uh, for two weeks as a volunteer. I, I took time off and I came over and then I saw what was happening at the time, very naively, we thought, um, you know, being raised in, in Europe, in a, what I realized now is a very privileged environment. Uh, we really thought, okay, this is a crisis. Um, it wasn't expected. Um, we need to fill in these gaps, but then the government will step in and then, you know, things will get better. But I've only seen things getting worse and worse. So for a year and a half, I kept having my life back home, coming here um, in summer or, or during breaks until in 2017, I decided that um, this was the life I wanted to, to have, like that it, it, things were not changing and somebody had to do something. And um, yeah, so that's what I decided to do. It's not an easy life. It's definitely not the life I used to have. Um, it's a lot of changes. It's mm, some sacrifices, mostly on a personal level, because it's always not easy to be away from home, um, missing out on many things happening there. My life here is mostly work. We work really, really long hours, which means I don't have a lot of time uh, for my personal life. But at the same time, it's a, it's a very full life. Um, I get a lot of energy from the people I meet, uh, from my students, from camp residents, but also we work in a very international environment. Not only our organization has staff from, from many countries, but also other organizations do. And seeing people committed to this the same way I am, it's it's really nice um, and, and it keeps me going. Um, but mostly it's seeing the impact that our work has. Um, simply um, giving a school to these kids, which again, should be normal, but isn't. So giving them a space obviously to learn, but also to you know, make friends and, uh, and learn who they are and discover talents. We, we had a child who really had never played the guitar and started playing in, uh, in our center that's called Mazi. It means together in Greece, in Greek. Um, he discovered he really liked playing guitars and he was actually quite talented at it. And, and now that it's been three years almost since uh, we built Still Arise and four years since uh, I've been here, I can see the impact that the place we created for them had. So again, it's not us, it's also the friendships they developed, the, who, who they became and, um, and where they are now and how, for example, some kids who learned English with us were then chosen for the relocation program to Ireland and they're now in Dublin because uh, they spoke good English how um, another former student is now in a camp on the mainland uh, she's been there a long time, sadly, and she hasn't been allowed to go to school. And she decided to start teaching younger children in the camp. So what she learned with us, because she was with us for a year or so, uh, she's now teaching to, to other kids in the camp. And she's with a group of other uh, teenage girls. They are fighting for the right to go to school and, and protesting and asking uh, to be sent to school. And I you know, I believe they, they've always had it in them. It's not like I or, you know, my team did 
anything with that, but we gave them the space um, to become that. And that makes me really proud of them and, and makes this life worth it, having an impact on, on other people. I, I, I had a very privileged life that was handed to me uh, without me really fighting for it. I was born in Italy by Italian parents, which means I hold a very powerful passport. I could travel. I was raised in the suburbs of Milan, very quiet, safe place. I was very supported by my family. I could study abroad. I, I could get an education. All of this I didn't earn, it was just given to me. And in Europe, so we are in the same, um, on the same soil, let's say, other people are not having any of their human rights respected simply because of a different passport. And that's not right. So I had all this privilege and I had a very happy and easy life. And I think it's important to do what I can to support others and to fight for their rights because everybody should get what I got. Absolutely, you are right. And as women, as journalists, independent journalists, not only in presence, but in a network of independent media, what can we do to help your activity. Thank you. I, I do absolutely believe in the importance of, of the media. And what you can do is make people aware of what is happening. Um, unfortunately, the conversation on migration in Europe has always been very superficial. It's many, you know, slogans or um, an article here and there, but there is never an in-depth discussion and information sharing about what is the situation really like on the ground. And it's very polarized one way or another. So what I see as people, because they are just people, um, you know, if you get to know them, like I know my students, you really see more similarities than difference, differences, but in the media, it's always either they are irregular migrants uh, or migrants or uh, refugees. We, you know, it's either we should send them away or poor people, we should welcome them. And we need to go a little bit behind that, that label and see that in the end they, again, are people. And of course, different languages, different cultures, I'm not saying it's uh, easy, but we all share as humans the same emotions. We all love, we all hate, we all, most of us wanna be with our family. Uh, we all uh, know what it's respect, what it's dignity and if we started seeing people, again, asylum seekers, refugees, migrants, as people, we would also understand their reasons. So the fact that for, again, different reasons, if they're here, it means they can't go back home. And probably everything they wish they could do was going back home, because if my home disappeared, there would be nothing more that I would want to be able to go home in freedom and safety though. So if it, this is where media comes in to tell the stories, to, to also have debates like that go a little bit further so that the average person can understand that we're not talking about an invasion. I mean, we, in, on the Greek islands, we really have a total of maybe 25,000 people. That's nothing for Europe. Um, Turkey hosts uh, 3.6 million Syrians. The, the, the refugee crisis in Europe doesn't really exist. We're talking about very, very low numbers. And so that's what media can do, you know, spread accurate information and start actual debates 
that start seeing migrants, refugees as people, first and foremost. Yeah, it's very clear. And so far, we have talked about the present. But this series of interview is called Women Who Build the Future. So can you describe the future you aspire to? Yes. So the future I aspire to is what we are trying to build in our schools. Um, our schools have children from many different nationalities and cultures and languages, as well as uh, international stuff, again, different languages and, um, and culture and backgrounds. So to me, the future we're trying to build is based on freedom. I think a lot of us take our freedom for granted. And it's obviously free, like physical freedom, you know, freedom to travel, freedom to not being locked in. Uh, it can be obviously freedom of speech, but mostly freedom of being whoever you want to be. Obviously, my freedom ends when your freedom starts, for sure. Um, but a world where people um, are different and can be different, and we respect each other, even if we are different. And uh, that is what we try to, to support in our schools to foster among our students and among staff and at the same time a justice so um again in our schools we have rules that apply to everyone we explain why the rules are there and there everybody has to follow them students and the uh, and staff um because even though we probably think in Europe, we have one of the most you know, advanced uh, democratic systems and we believe in justice. In practice, uh, it's, justice is not really served here uh, because again, um, there are certain laws that apply everywhere in Europe. There is the rights of the child convention, the human rights convention, and still none of these rights apply to asylum seekers here. We are on the same soil, but we have different passports. That's the difference. So that shouldn't be. So I hope our future is more free and more just, not just in Greece, um, but all over the world. I think of Syria. Uh, we're going into 10 years of war next week, a conflict that's highly ignored, uh, especially now, and that doesn't seem to have an end in sight. And Syrians deserve justice and they deserve freedom, as well as so many other people around the world. So I hope we can move towards a yeah, more free and a more just world. Yeah. So Julia, really, thank you very much. Thank you, Anna, and thank you for having me. Really, thank you for sharing your experiences. Happy to. And, and also for showing us that a new world that is based on solidarity, on true human relation, already exists. And as independent journalists, I think we have a duty, a, a kind of mission, to show this new world and to give space to all, to all the people like you. So thank you, thank Anna, you very, very kind. Thank of you very much. Thank you. And good work. Thank you. Appreciate it.